Okay, welcome to note set number 16. <clears throat> I'm trying a slightly different setup with my tablet so that <clears throat> maybe my pen won't be so misbehaving, especially up in the upper right hand corner. So we'll give that a try and see how that works. So um, now we're going to uh, continue to explore using Fourier transform properties. So we've, we've seen a few of those, uh, in particular the big one that tells us that um, we can use multiplication by a frequency response in the frequency domain to get um, the output of, of a system. Uh, we've also used the delay property to analyze uh, acoustic reflections and things like that, but there's a whole bunch more uh, things that we can do. So um, one thing to remember is that these properties allow us to um, make better use of our Fourier transform table by expanding the uh, its capabilities, but more importantly helps us understand uh, some of the real-world things that engineers do with Fourier transforms. So let's take a look at this uh, example. Suppose, uh, you know, this is kind of a stupid textbook problem, but it illustrates how uh, we might use uh, the property of linearity. Suppose we have a signal that looks like this and we need to find the Fourier transform of it. So we look on our table and we say, hmm, I don't see anything on the table that looks like that. What do I do? Um, well, we could break it down into um, a sum of signals that are on the, the table that we have. Um, so we look carefully at it and, and we recognize that we can break it down into the sum of two rectangles that when added together gives us um, this little stepwise pulse that, that we're interested in. Um, so by linearity um, it's easy to show that once we have um, the signal written this way in terms of a width 4 and a width 2 pulse, <clears throat> the linearity allows us to just take the Fourier transform of each of those individually. Um, so each of those are uh, a sync function with you know, different parameters inside the argument of the sync uh, based upon the, the width of the of the pulse. So I would encourage you to um, verify that you know how to go from uh, a P4 uh, to this and P sub 2 to that. Um, but this is how we would use this result. So there is uh, a very simple application. Um, now an even more important idea is to understand how the modulation property leads to our understanding of how we do RF or radio frequency communication. Um, so we're going to look at how to make a very simple radio system and if you remember way back at the beginning of the course I talked about how not every engineer um, designs the circuits. Um, some have to think about the big system picture. Um, so there's a lot of communications engineers who never design the circuitry that goes into your cell phone, but they're thinking about how does the system work from a signals and systems point of view? What kind of signaling? How do we make more uh, data be able to be sent while using only the same small amount of bandwidth? All those kinds of things. Um, so we're not going to answer all those questions here, but um, we will get an idea as to how we use Fourier transform ideas to think about these things. So here's a simple transmitter. TX is an abbreviation for transmitter. Um, so suppose we've got a microphone here, picks up a sound, goes through an amplifier. Uh, now we've got a signal X of T that we'd like to send someplace. Here's a simple way to do it. We have an oscillator that generates a cosine at some appropriately high frequency omega sub zero. Uh, and we multiply this cosine times that x of t. And so that box that takes in a, a signal and multiplies it by uh, an oscillator is, is called a modulator. And uh, um, so we're going to, and then we amplify that resulting signal, send it to an antenna and this high frequency high power signal will then radiate off that antenna. Um, so let's take a look at how this works and uh, this also illustrates how somebody working at this level might just work with iconic shapes for their Fourier transforms rather than worrying about what they'll really look like. 
Um, so it becomes a kind of a mindset, a way of thinking, a, a framework for thinking about how systems behave and work. So suppose we have a Fourier transform uh, of our message signal and it looks something like this and we might think about you know what that frequency is there so you know maybe we'll say that's some bandwidth B um, and <clears throat> then we're going to have um, an idea of, of what gets uh, transmitted so we won't worry about the effect of the amplifier um, nor will we worry about physically how the antenna works um, but this this modulation property tells us that when we multiply x of t by a cosine in the free, uh, in the time domain it's going to take this spectrum and move it so it's centered at omega 0 and centered at minus omega 0 that's our modulation property um, if you're unfamiliar if you don't remember that property pause the video go back um, look at your property sheet go back and review that lecture um, that just briefly talked about the modulation property so um, what we're going to do is choose F sub 0 um, which is the Hertz version of Omega sub 0 um, choose it sufficiently high uh, to enable um, the antenna to radiate this energy so um, you know electromagnetic theory will tell you that you've got to get up above 10 kilohertz or so to um, to be able to radiate well um, but typically we go even higher than that uh, so AM radio uh, is in the, uh, the region around 1 megahertz FM radio is around 100 megahertz um, cell phones um, even higher um, so every communication technology ends up being allocated a certain band uh, to operate in and sometimes that allocation allocation is done um, in a reasonable way and some sometimes it's constrained by other things and um, is not necessarily the best place for it to be but that's what the FCC Federal Communications Commission does for a living uh, so to speak so now we've got this this uh, spectrum that's up in the middle you know up in the high frequencies and it's radiated uh, propagates across the electromagnetic uh, um, uh, across the air via electromagnetic radiation and propagation and is now picked up at some antenna here and we want to understand how this system for receiving actually works so um, here I show the red triangle spectrum uh, that's our desired signal but we have to um, take into account that somebody else could be transmitting um, signals and here we're banking on the fact that um, through regulations they are perhaps prohibited from uh, transmitting in our little band around omega zero but they could be transmitting on uh, nearby um, center frequencies or carrier frequencies and uh, so our antenna may actually pick those up as well um, and so that's the purpose of well the amplifier takes the small signal and makes it bigger uh, the filter is going to get rid of these undesired signals so we can see that we need some sort of RF radio frequency RF version of a bandpass filter to um, to make that happen uh, so the filter that uh, removes uh, those undesirable signals um, you know we've already seen a little bit about ideal filters but we're going to learn how to make those out of RLC circuits uh, in, in just a little while so we'll assume that we have some sort of ideal low, uh, bandpass filter here that that gets rid of those undesired signals um, so that's what that that first stage does there <clears throat> and again that all comes from this this viewpoint that's one of our Fourier transform properties um, and that's the big one so now going into the demodulator part of the receiver we have um, our desired signal centered at omega zero uh, and if we look at this demodulator it looks remarkably similar to the modulator in fact it is virtually identical um, so we multiply by a cosine and uh, what that does is two things now this this cosine here is going to take this whole spectrum and shift it up and shift it down so when it shifts it up this part goes here and this part goes there 
So that's that's the shifting up part. Uh, and then the shifting down, let's see, I don't have, do I have that? No, okay, so the, the shifting down part, um, this part goes here, uh, and this part goes all the way out there at minus 2 omega 0. Um, so our, our modulation property says that we get both of those, and they get added together. And so uh, we get a double one here. And then um, we still have those that are that are out there. Now we don't want those. We want this. So this filter here would be a low pass filter that we could imagine being some sort of ideal low pass filter that would get rid of those high frequency ones and keep the low frequency part that we want. Um, so that's that's what we would do to get rid of this extra stuff that we don't want. Um, the, the low pass filter gets rid of that and lo and behold uh, we have returned to our desired spectrum shape that's the spectrum of our original message signal um, and so then the amplifier makes that stronger and drives the speaker and, and we hear the message um, so um, this was all um, this is a, a very simple scheme for communication. Um, it's actually what's called double sideband or DSB um, suppressed carrier. If you go on and take a course in communications, you'll you'll learn about this. Um, but the reality is, is this this scheme is is really not a widespread um, practical scheme. And to really build it, we would need a few other things that I've kind of glossed over, and I'm not going to spend any time on that. But it's a nice um, introduction to the ideas of shifting things up to higher frequencies to get them into different um, spectrum, uh, spectral regions. So um, no matter what kind of um, modulation scheme you use, what kind of communication scheme you use, um, that idea is always there. So this idea of shifting things around with a multiplication by, uh, by a cosine, that, that's, that's all over the place in this communication stuff. Um, so the, the, the key things is that you know, we can upshift uh, a spectrum um, and Fourier transform modulation property tells us what we need to do to build this thing. We need to have an oscillator and we need to have a multiplier. Um, so now the people who design electronics are, are given the task figure out a circuit that oscillates and gives me a cosine. Figure out a circuit that will take in two voltages and create a voltage that's the product of them. Um, so um, you can see how these ideas drive um, what needs to be built. Um, again, same thing on, uh, you know, um, this should say key operation at the receiver is downshifting the received spectrum. And again, we need the same kind of circuitry. And it also shows us that we need filters, um, filters to get rid of this extra spectrum stuff. And the Fourier transform theory tells us where that extra spectrum stuff is. Um, so it tells us what kinds of filters we need to design and, 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 and why. Um, so we still need to figure out how to make these filters and how to do real world filtering. Um, but we now know that um, you know, that's something that's worth our while um, to learn how to do. Okay, let's look at another topic. Um, we just assumed that the, the signal that we were going to transmit had a spectrum that looked like this and stopped at some frequency B, minus B. Um, and we often use these kind of iconic pictures when we're plotting our system level visions of, of what we want done. But it's important to realize um, or ask the question, is it possible to really have a signal that is perfectly band limited like that? It's zero outside a certain range of frequencies. So that's what we want to talk about now. So a definition, a signal is said to be time limited or of finite duration. Um, if, if we can pick two numbers that Outside of the interval between those two numbers, the signal is identically zero everywhere outside that interval. Um, so that's what it says to be time limited. Now there may be some interval in, in between where it goes to zero but then comes out of being zero. That would still be allowed. The point is is this is the, the interval outside of which it's never uh, non-zero. 
So that's a time limited signal. And then similarly, we can say a signal is band limited if there's some number b, uh, and then consequently minus b that um, uh, sets a frequency above which, or you know, outside of which, the spectrum is identically equal to zero. Um, so I'm specifying b here in hertz, so that's why we're showing the 2 pi b um, on this omega axis. Um, now, um, here is a fact. So I state it as a fact. We could prove this, but we're not going to do that. Um, but here's the fact. Fact just means something that's true that, I, that we could prove, but I don't want to take the time to prove it. Uh, you cannot have a signal that is both time limited and band limited. So if you have a signal that is time limited, it cannot be band limited. And if you had a signal that is band limited, the signal cannot be time limited. Um, so what that means is that for all practical signals, so in our communication system that we were just talking about, obviously the message has to start at some time and has to stop at some time. Therefore, all practical signals are time limited. Therefore, all practical signals cannot be band limited. So our little vision of this thing being perfectly band limited was a little bit of wishful thinking. Actually, it was a lot of wishful thinking. Um, however, um, it is completely possible, and, and thankfully so, um, that these time limited practical uh, signals uh, they may not be perfectly band limited, but they can be effectively band limited. In other words, they eventually decay down so small uh, to such a small level um, that we can say that outside a certain band, they, they're, they're negligible. Um, so, um, you know, here's a picture of of uh, some spectrum, uh, you know, possible real world kind of spectrum. And um, you know we can set some particular level here set by that horizontal dashed red line, um, and and what the level that we set to is going to be dependent upon you know our specific application. Uh, I like to joke that it depends on whether you're working for Mattel or Motorola, um, you know where you have to set that line. If you're if you're making a toy for Mattel, um, you can set that line pretty high. If you're working for Motorola and making very high quality communication devices, um, then you, you might want to set that level low because um, you, you can't really um, uh, withstand having um, high levels um, outside, outside of your band. So um, this allows us to um, have an application driven specification of what we consider to be our bandwidth. So we set that horizontal level and then we look to see um, how far out in frequency do we have to go until we're sure that we'll, our spectrum will never pop up above that level and we say that's the effective bandwidth. Now just a little warning there's there's lots of ways to define effectively uh, you know, an effective bandwidth uh, of a signal. So when somebody starts talking to you about a signal with a certain bandwidth, one of the first things you might want to ask them is, okay, so what exactly is your definition of the bandwidth? How do you define that? Um, so sometimes it's um, defined going out to this first null, uh, sometimes it's defined with some specific level here. Uh, sometimes it's actually when you drop to 3 dB below your 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 center value. Um, so there's a lot of different definitions, and uh, you kind of need to keep track of wh which one somebody is using. Um, so this effective bandwidth. Um, lots of signals fill up these low frequencies like this. You know, audio signals are like that. Um, we just saw uh, those RF signals. They're concentrated around some high frequency. Um, so um, th those are not in this category of what we would call low pass signals. Um, so um, you can think about the effect of bandwidth being defined as, um, you know, be such that we're inside, uh, we're mostly inside of, of, of that 
that particular band. Um, so you know, um, so audio signals and things like that are this are this type of of, of signal. So uh, for example, high fidelity audio signals. Um, most audio engineers will tell you that the effective bandwidth of, of an audio signal is 20 kilohertz. That's largely driven by the fact that we can only hear up to about 20 kilohertz. Um, so um, if we were to remove the stuff above 20 kilohertz, most of us wouldn't be able to really tell that it's been removed. Um, so when we have audio signals, we've likely passed them through a filter that's removed those high frequencies. Now, uh, speech on a phone line um, has a bandwidth of about four kilohertz. So, uh, you know, long ago, telephone engineers figured out that, um, you know, if you limited speech to a bandwidth of about four kilohertz by using uh, a filter, um, it still was intelligible. You could tell what was being spoken. You could tell who was speaking. Um, and so they, they designed the telephone system such that it only needed to pass signals um, up to about four kilohertz or so. Uh, and that made the design of, of that system more effective and, and efficient. Um, now the, the RF or radio frequency signals that we were talking about for communication, they're not centered um, down at, at um, DC, they're centered around some higher frequency. Uh, so in this case, uh, our bandwidth would be, um, you know, this width, um, defined with some effective measure. Um, and uh, so these would be called bandpass signals, and, and you can kind of see that uh, the reason for why they would be called that. Um, so um, an FM station, uh, an FM commercial radio station has a bandwidth uh, of about 20 kilohertz. That's the allocated uh, channel width that, that they have, uh, that they're given by the FCC. Uh, and the FCC also requires that they be spaced such that um, they're always centered at a, 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 a frequency that has an odd digit there. So um, the station at 90.5, centered at 90.5, uh, would go from 90.4 megahertz up to 90.6, so that that's a 200 kilohertz um, bandwidth. Um, and you'll also notice that to uh, ensure that no two stations overlap, uh, and they have this 200 kilohertz allocation, um, that means that every station will be um, centered at some odd digit there. AM stations, on the other hand, have a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. Now, um, you'll notice that, that that FM stations are quite a bit wider. It's not because, um, well, they, they do send a higher bandwidth audio signal, um, but it's, it's not 200 kilohertz worth of audio signal. An FM signal actually um, has a bandwidth much bigger than the message signal that's being sent and, and there's reasons why that's done um, and you'll have to take a communications class to learn that. Um, but uh, an AM station has a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz allocated to it um, and it's it's down in the thousands of kilohertz so it's you know in the in the one megahertz region uh, 1.5 and so forth and uh, so 1640 kilohertz on your radio um, it's centered at that but it's going to uh, spread from 30 to 50 um, so if, if you've ever wondered why all of the um, stations always have uh, a zero here and an even digit there now you know why um, so we'll stop there for this video lecture, and uh, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.